I'm Gilson Shashnik. This is Coffee Talk. Everyone, I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the chair of the guitar department at Berklee College of Music, and welcome to another Coffee Talk. As usual, we are joined by Assistant Chair Cheryl Bailey. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, got my Berkeley mug guitar department. Cheers. Cheers. Me too. Cheers. And our senior coordinator, Ben Cody. Hey, Ben. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and our special guest today is the chair of the ear training department, Jilson Shoshnik. Hey, Jilson, how are you? Great. Thank you for having me. I, I, I need to get this. Ooh. I don't have I don't have a guitar mug, so I, I just have espresso oh. cup. Well, we're going to fix that. We're going to bring you one of these. And yes, then pretty please. soon, I think they will show up um, in the bookstore. Is that true, Ben? We're working on it. Yeah, I think it, we're still in the process of getting all that taken care yeah. of. A lot of people want the guitar department coffee mug, which I get. So we're going to have a special coffee talk mug coming soon. Um, yes. But um, Justin, what is your coffee routine? My co So uh, I have uh, a Nespresso machine at home and I have one latte in the morning mm -hmm. and then I have one latte in the afternoon. That's it. Nice. And you make them both yourself? Yes. Well, in the afternoon, sometimes just to get out of the office, I'll go across the street and, and have one at uh, Italy or pavement. Do you have like bean preferences or anything like that? Um, well, I, I don't, the only one that I know that from the Nespresso that I like a lot is called, uh, it's a Jamaican Blue Mountain. Mm. That's, mm. that's really good. Have you found that your coffee routine like has to shift when you're on the road or is it pretty consistent? Like when you're traveling to play, do you require certain things or can you just adapt? It's depending on where you go. It's funny, like if you're in Europe, mm -hmm. anywhere you're all set if you like coffee because every place is coffee is great. But in the U.S., depending on where you are, you find like uh, in hotels, they have like those the coffee that is sitting there and it's burnt and it's watery and it's, it's hard to get a depending where you are. You know, it's hard to get a good cup of coffee. Yeah. yeah, I was laughing when you said that because our our um, leader Ron Savage was on this program, and he he said that after being in Italy one time for a long period of time, he couldn't drink um, coffee in the United States anymore. Like he yeah. sworn it off and switched to tea because it's so far superior that yeah. he can't can take it. I don't understand. I, that's my. I've been living in the United States for thirty three years. And I don't understand why is it so hard to make uh, good coffee? It shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. you know? So basic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good that you're here because I think in general, but just because of the nature of your work at Berkeley, we're going to be talking a lot about fundamentals. So it's nice to start with a fundamental of <laughs> yeah. fundamental in coffee. Uh, but before we get into um all of that you're playing and your work here, a lot of people who are listening to this um, are kind of looking forward to their first days at Berkeley or still, they're still experiencing some firsts. And you've had a couple of different firsts here because you were a faculty member for a long time and now a chair. And a student oh, first. Oh, wow. So three firsts. Are there yeah. things that stand out to you as first impressions in, in one or each of those first days for you? Well, uh, for, so f as, a, as a student, and I arrived here like to the United States, I think a week before registration. And in those, this is before computers. So registration was everybody together in the performance center. And then you, this would take hours, hours, hours to do registration. So my first experience was going to the, what's the name that the, the pizza place, it doesn't exist anymore, is on Boylston uh, near where like pavement is or those, there used to be a, a pizza place there, awful. Little, Little Steve's? Uh, yes. I used to love that place. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> <That's> okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, you get like a pizza and, and you have to mop up the oil. It'll take like 15 minutes to just uh, to take some of the oil. But anyway, in Brazil, I'm from Brazil. So in Brazil, when you, you go to, there's a lot of like corner kind of, it's not like a, we call bar, but it's not a bar to have drinks. You have coffee. It's like a coffee house, but that people have lunch there. It's every corner in Brazil has one. It's like a Portuguese heritage. So uh, when they have pizza and it's, you always order a slice, you know, you don't order a whole pizza. So in Brazil, you go to those places and you order a pizza and they give you a slice. So I went to, to, to that place and I ordered a pizza and then they give me an entire pie. So that's my first uh, cultural shock uh, starting. And uh, so I remember, uh, when you the 150 building used to be completely different the entrance were how, the way it is now so in those days when you got in uh first of all you didn't go downstairs so it's like the same level and on your right there was a, a uh they call the project band room and there was for the big band so it was a large room that doesn't exist anymore so right the first thing on your right side so I remember going there and hearing this unbelievable music coming inside. This is my first day, right? Not, not going to registration, completely like shocked with everything. So I hear this music and I thought, well, this is like a recording because it sounded so unbelievable. And it was, uh, they put together a group of like the top students playing. And it was um, Antonio Hart on saxophone, and I think Paula Duca on bass, um, Jordi Rossi on drums. I think it was like some ridiculous band playing, maybe Kurt Rosenwinkel. I can't remember who it. I heard that, and and they're like, "Oh, these are our students," and I I remember distinctly that I wanted to go call my father and ask for a ticket to go back because it's like if this is this is the average student at Berkeley I I can't do it but then later you find out it's not quite like that and there's all kinds of levels so that's my so that's for like as a student you know um, mm -hmm. my first uh, kind of shock experience you know um faculty as a faculty the first class that i taught uh they just put me go teach a entering uh your training two class just go as like <laughs> do what have and and that i think was the best class i've ever had or one of the best classes it was just like a incredible class we, and and uh, it's so much so that I'm in contact with with some of those students to this day. You know, this was in 2002, and um, it was just amazing. They would get together outside of class two, three times a week to practice, uh, just on their own. It was just amazing. And then uh, you you think, oh, every class is going to be like that, right? But uh, then you you discover it's not quite like that. And uh, let's see. So that as a faculty um, and as a chair, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys, you know, the, the it every day is a, is a surprise, you know, just uh, the, the, the main thing for me that I was warned, but you don't realize until it happens to you is that the day that you become the chair, all the people that were co colleagues uh, the day before, it changes the relationship completely. You know, you're not a colleague anymore. You are uh, the boss, you know. So you, you don't see yourself differently, but people outside see you differently. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really valuable. I think it's good for everyone to 
think about that no matter what your position is and what your role is in your musical life, because that's true for so many things, right? That you don't think about if, if you're in a band and then you become a band leader, it's really a different role. Yeah. And I see a lot of students working with that transition and, um, and kind of thinking like, well, you know, oh, it'll just be like hanging out with my friends, except now we're doing the music I choose, but it's not really like that. No. You can still have a really good, solid collegial relationship and you can still have a friendship with people, but it will, it will shift. Um, yeah, because if you have a band and it could be your best friend is playing with you, if that person is late for the gig, it reflects on you. Mm -hmm. So you ultimately you're responsible for that. So then you have to have the tough conversation. And that's when uh, sometimes conflict arises, you know? So. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting too, because there are those relationships that are really defined in some ways where you have to make that shift in your mind. And then there are the ones like we're watching some of our students and go through what we've gone through and having a duo or having a trio or having a quartet where there's some where it's like, this is my quartet, right? Um, but mm -hmm. there are others where people feel like, oh, there's not really a leader. Like we all share mm -hmm. the leadership responsibility, especially when it's two. Um, we have mm -hmm. a really high level duo right now of students and I'm in a duo. And I remember that, you know, just at, when you're in that, you have to really start to think about the way that who's going to take care of what and how you're going to interact and, and be aware of when the dynamics might cause some stress. And I remember mm -hmm. saying to a friend who um, one time I was in a group, I was in a different duo. And, and I said to a, a friend of mine, I just said, wow, you know, sometimes I just feel like, um, I just feel like I don't have any power in this situation. And she said, what are you talking about? Like you have all the power, like from mm -hmm. the outside, it looked totally different to her. Mm -hmm. It didn't look that way to me because maybe there was something I was a little more insecure about in my own playing, or I thought that the other person was stronger here or there, but maybe they're feeling that way. So there's so many interpersonal relationships and everything you talked about that I think people who are listening, it's good to be aware. And then, and then there's the partnership like you have with Cheryl that I have with my assistant chair, you know, if, if that part partnership has to be like a very well-oiled machine for things to work you know that's like a crucial right i think that's true too i mean just having seen like all of these different relationships from your perspective in one place like berkeley like obviously berkeley has changed a lot over mm -hmm. the decades that you've been here are there things that maybe you wish you knew or things that you really have learned from changing roles so many times that you feel like you're still working on or that really come to mind in, in your new role and your new partnership? Well, there are things that I think it's like those things. Oh, I wish I knew I would have done it differently, mm -hmm. but it, it's like a, a sort of like one of those impossible things because the only reason why you know now is because you went through so there's no way to avoid you know but yeah there's there's things that you um as a leader sometimes you're too eager to please everybody and you overextend yourself or you put yourself in situations that now knowing better i'll say well you can't please everybody you know and uh and you have to accept that so yeah uh, right. things like that and 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 but you know like every huge institution um you have to know how to navigate and and um and uh i won't get into the specifics or even mention the story but kim you know because we have a converse we had a conversation and you have to learn how to deal with personalities and how to navigate that and and uh, and understand. I, I think trying to understand where the other person is coming from is tremendously helpful, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, that could diffuse a lot of uh, conflicts. You know, as a segue from what you're saying now into sort of the way you think as a teacher and a performer, 
I'm wondering if, you know, this idea where now as an older person and a more mature musician, you look back and you say, okay, there were ways I could have dealt with things differently, but you're also Mm -hmm. teaching people who are a lot younger than you are and earlier along. And, and I think a lot of the faculty and, and like fellow teachers who listen to this are kind of listening for the ways that teachers approach things. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, oftentimes we all agree that sometimes you have to push a lot of times, maybe all the time, you have to push students out of the comfort zone so that growth is possible. How yeah. do you balance what you know now and what they're coming to learn? Right. So like maybe no. someone has to have another five years or so to to realize the importance of something that, you know, is important. So how do you balance being emphatic about the importance of something you're teaching or that you're valuing in your curriculum? And also, like, when do you sort of push and when do you leave room for someone to maybe figure it out at a different time? Well, I, I think that maybe you see this in the guitar department i'm not sure but for example the biggest challenge that i feel i had uh, teaching and i think still all the faculty have in ear training particularly is that in certain ways the whole music education industry ended up working against us uh, and, and i'll explain what I, what I mean by that. If you go way back, let's take jazz, okay? Uh, let's take the, the subject of jazz uh, um, uh, instruction or, or learning. If you go back, I don't know, 60 years, 70 years, there are no books or the, the only way that you could learn is by listening and transcribing, analyzing, figuring out what and imitating and then creating there was no other way you know so and even for tunes you couldn't go on a gig there was no real book so either you knew the tunes and you learn it by ear or you couldn't work professionally right so that already no one had to explain why ear training is important it's self-evident and and there was almost like a natural selection to 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 have people that could survive as as performers right or composers or arrangers uh then we created all this now you have a book for everything you want how to hold the pick what finger you use and now you have videos oh you want to play with like whatever that here's a video showing you don't have to hear anything or read anything and just watch the video and mimic the motion, you know? So now, but what, what I think I see a lot on, on young musicians and students coming that follow that route, because I think it's natural for human beings to, fi- to try to find shortcuts. It's hardwired on us to do the least amount of effort, you know? Uh, so of course, if I'm presenting here, this is your strategy for the next 10 years of your life. You're going to transcribe all of that and you're going to analyze and it's going to be really hard, but it's going to get better and blah, blah, blah. Or watch this video and 15 minutes later, magically, you're going to be playing like Wes Montgomery. Mm-hmm. Except that one is fake because it's you're not... Um, developing the skills you're just mimicking stuff you're not understanding the the you're not abstracting the principle so you can apply to other things you know so but trying to convince young students that eventually they're gonna get on a a, a dead end and they always because they can't hear themselves and and learn and and become their own teachers they all always going to be depending on a teacher that gives them this information right yeah and i think hand in hand with that is you know i i went to classical music school and i went to different i went to a conservatory style program university style program state school style program so different 
types of programs, but the, it was much more like athletics, mm. you know, you get into the program, you know, you have to be at a certain level to get in, you know, like everywhere. But then when you're there, it's like the way that an athlete has to listen to a coach, you had to listen to the faculty or you were asked to leave. It, it wasn't a choice. Mm. And um, I think that because of that, the programs couldn't have unlimited choices for you. So there are a lot of things you have to find on your own. But the idea was that if you really trusted the person who was the expert and let them push you when you couldn't see why, you you know, mm -hmm. just go for it and just push. And then you'll be at a level in which you'll know how to put things together. And I think we're in a time where people want to be able to choose before they they want to be able to say well thanks for your advice um i don't know if that feels right to me but when you're in an earlier stage of your development things don't feel right to you all the time you have to push through and do the hard thing yeah. and of course you have a trusted teacher and you have to make sure you're you know you're healthy and um you're not doing anything that would like physically harm you um mm -hmm. because you don't want that but i think that um this idea that that uh, everything is a conversation can be detrimental in a different way. You know, like people feel like, well, if I'm uncomfortable, um, my goal is to be comfortable. And maybe the goal is that you could be comfortable being uncomfortable so that you can grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's and the I only way to grow. Right. Right. Do you believe that? I think so. I think, uh, I think that the, uh, well, it's like uh, when you practice, right? You're practicing something that you're not good at. So you're constantly having to fight your ego because your ego doesn't accept that you, it was, no, 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 the jump, let, let's do something else all the time. Like I want the dessert, I want the dessert. And, uh, and uh, it's like a little kid inside of you and, um, and you have to accept that you're going to suck at that, then you're not going to sound great until you master that, you know? And, and I think, I mean, at my observation, all the, the, I don't like to use the word genius, but like all the like phenomenal musicians that I had the pleasure to either meet or play with during my life, they all come like from very different backgrounds and ways of learning but one thing i think they all had in common which is the this ability to not only accept that they almost enjoyed doing this very methodic simple you know it was a uh, curious like a couple of weeks ago i don't know if you if you any of you had a chance to go but benny green the great jazz pianist benny green was doing a workshop here at berkeley and he was showing, someone was asking him about how he practiced and stuff. So he went and got his metronome in his backpack and put like, a, so he put like first at 40 and started to playing uh, easy leaving, right? And they said, no, no, it's still too fast. So he went to 35, play, no, still too fast, went to 30. So that was, the 30 was the half note, right? And he started just playing this stride, boom, and simple improvisation. It's just playing the tune first like that, you know? And he said, I do that for hours, and I pay attention if I'm relaxed while I'm doing this, and I, and I do this every day, and, I'm, and I record myself, he said, I record myself, and you have to accept that that and it's, I can't remember exactly, but he was so, so it's so beautiful the way he said that you have to be honest with yourself and and sit there and listen and say, oh, my God, that sounded bad because that's your teaching moment. Right. Why did it sound? Let me work on this. I'm, I'm rushing on this or I'm dragging or I'm flubbing the nose, whatever, you know, so uh, I. I think that the pleasure and the joy and the absorption on on and facing the stuff that you're bad at, you know, that in the end, uh, I think people talk about talent and I don't know. 
it's it's hard there's definitely people with they're born with some facilities on thing but i think this factor is even more important than than talent you know because i've 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 remember one person specifically specifically when i when i uh came to berkeley this he was like a superstar i'm not even going to mention the instrument because i don't want to but he was like the superstar everybody was in awe he could play faster he has the best years i've ever seen chops everything he did like 19 recitals a day because everybody wanted to play with him and nothing happened with him because he what whatever it is that he was at the beginning he never grew he just gave in into this superstar mentality and 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 i've seen other people that when they were at berkeley they were just like regular nobody thought and now these people are like in the cover of magazines you know like they're like the but they're like super hard working you know serious yeah i agree with that i i think i've experienced that too i, I think and i see cheryl and ben nodding and i i think we've all all seen that um and i wanted you to talk a little bit more about what you're talking about as it applies to ear training, because I think it's such a scary topic for some of us and <laughs> for all of us. Um, I remember when, for example, when I went to undergrad, um, I had placed really high on my instrument and I, um, I was never really afraid, even when people were really harsh. Um, I was never afraid of that kind of hard work or the feedback. I would just, it would just make me dig in more. Mm -hmm. And I felt that about the academics, but there's something about the ear where I felt very vulnerable, like almost like if I couldn't do something in ear training, there was like a secret that I shouldn't really be here, you know, because I think we're not vocalists. Yeah. So we don't have that experience where your instrument is a part of your body, unless it's your ear. And I was not confident singing. Like I would, I was the kid who would be like physically ill before ear training. And then I had these really great teachers, one of whom was a dean here, Kari Usula, was one of my yeah. ear training And, you know, he was great because he was also on my instrumental juries. So he was the, I think it was my second year of college. And he would just kind of find me and be like, okay, look, you just have to go step by step, just like you do everything else. And he was the person who kind of coaxed me into seeing it as just another instrument. But wow, like getting over that initial fear um, mm -hmm. that paralyzes you. Um, I think a lot of people have that. And I'm wondering how you, you know, you are a great instrumentalist. And then you're also an expert in teaching people how to use this instrument of our ear. So how do you help people with that feeling? Well, well, I, I, will, I, will, I will accept expert in teaching just for the fact that I've, I've taught for so many years because I don't really believe in experts because, you know, I don't think that there's one system. You know, there's all, there are different ways that people done and, and have been very successful. Um, so I think there's several ways. What's the I, it's one of the worst sayings. There's several ways to skin a cat. I don't know. There's, this is the worst saying ever, but it keeps popping in my head. But anyway, uh, so the uh, uh, the I think, for example, th there's a thing about your training and again is is uh, related to ego right and which is you could train your fingers like an acrobat to do things that are really impressive and still you don't hear anything that you're doing you know so when you have to actually sing you feel like very exposed right that and i think that's why people feel that's the insecurity you know because you have nothing to nothing you have no crutch you have nothing you have it's that's what you really hear you know and um the three completely opposite examples so i remember this is maybe 10 years ago for some reason during a particular season of auditions because i i used to do a lot of auditions for Berkeley, you know, for, for 15 years. So 
um, I remember for that particular season, we would get a lot of guitar players that were like shredders. Then, then it disappeared. I don't know. It was like some, maybe there's some famous player and then every person applying for Berkeley wanted to be that player. I don't know. But anyway, so I would see some of them on the prepared piece and it was unbelievable. I mean, the execution, perfect. Like the sweeping, I don't know how you call it, like, you know, sweeping thing on the, it was just like ridiculous. Those crazy arpeggios. I'll be like, what the? But then you do like a simple, the most simple ear training thing, the, the most simple. I would play one note on the piano. And I'll say, find that note on your guitar. Boom, boom, boom. 15 minutes to, to find the note. So I started to think, how is it possible? And then by asking them how they learn, it's on a YouTube video. And for them, they approach music like a video game. So they're like, oh, in, in high school, we had this competition. Who can go faster? And I watch the video and, I, and I, uh, they have the tabs, right? And I copy. So it's completely unmusical, you know? So that's one extreme that shows the other. I don't know uh, if you ever, ever heard, there's a, 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 a recording. I think John Hendricks is the leader. But it has George Benson, Al Jarreau, Bobby McFerrin, and John Hendricks. And the rhythm section is Tommy Flanagan. I, it's like amazing. I can't, I think Jimmy Cobb, I, and I can't remember who's the bass player. It's like amazing. And they do, uh, they transcribed uh, uh, for Miles, like Freddie the Freeloader. And each mm -hmm. one of those, scats the solo so benson does cannonball adderley i think and then bobby mcferrin does miles and john hendrix does co-train anyway so they they do that and then they have they play olio where they just improvise and what blew my mind is benson solos on olio without the guitar, just voice, and sounds exactly like he sounds playing guitar. Exactly. So it was like, okay, now I know why he's George Benson, you know. Chet Baker is another example. When you find his solos that he's singing, he sounds exactly like he sounds on trumpet. Uh, Louis Armstrong is the same. So uh, I think there's a purity there. There's a truth there. You know, but you have to be humble and 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 start. You know, um, and going back. Sorry, I, I sort of went on a tangent. That uh, I hope this is uh, help, uh, valuable. But uh, as far there's so many things to practice for your training that you could start. You could start with intervals. You know, be methodic. You know, master one interval, master the other. You could start learning a song by year and you have to be humble maybe you have to start with a with a nursery rhyme you know maybe you can't start with uh you know messia or something like that you have to start with a nursery rhyme then once you learn that that nursery rhyme see if you can transpose it by year to different keys then see if you can play on your instrument that, you know, um, then you can, once you start get better, you start more complex tunes, see if you can sing, um, you know, I was, I still practice this and it's extremely challenging for me. I, I did the other day, um, I was I'm talking about the tune, I, I kind of had to revisit uh, um, Easy Living, right, after I heard uh, Benny Green, I said, oh, but, I had played it, but I hadn't played in a while, so I had to kind of remember. So I was doing this exercise, which I think is great. I was, my left hand is playing the root motion and I'm singing the melody. That one goes relatively well, uh, but then playing the melody with my right hand and singing the root motion, that one 
kick my butt seriously. I had to slow the way down and do, but just singing the root motion of tunes or transposing, you know, that's like an amazing ear training exercise in there, you know. So uh, just singing chord qualities, just sing one, three, five, seven, one flat three, five flat seven, one, three, five flat seven, sing all the, like, for example, the four basic chord qualities for major seven chords, you know, um, there's so many things that you can do that a person can do, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I love this idea of being curious about what you can't do, what you can do, and then seeing like your classes and your teachers is helping you develop yourself, not sort of weeding you out. Mm -hmm. It's not that someone's going to say you don't belong here. It's that, you know, you're here to learn. And my first year training teacher who terrified everyone, he used to ask us all the time if we believed that teaching was an adversarial profession. <laughs> and now that I'm a teacher, I know that he said that because we're all hiding from the work instead of embracing our level and then asking him for help. That's all well, he wanted was, can you help me? Like well, well, I failed well, this quiz, but how do I not fail this quiz? <laughs> you know? And exactly. I, yeah, I wanted that because I think there's a, there's a, a responsibility for a teacher, right? I, I had a lesson once this very famous uh, guy, he's a very famous teacher. Well, I won't mention him. And I went to New York to study with him and said, well, play. And I play. And he, he was so negative about everything I did e He's, he got to a point and said, you know what, I'm feeling so bad about myself that I'm just going to wait for the, the lesson to be over and just going to ride this and I'll never see this person again. You know, so I finish and I'm, I'm leaving the apartment and it's like, thank you so much. And it's like, wait, I said, uh, what, you're not going to, this was great. You're not going to schedule your last, <laughs> your next lesson. I love this. Let's do it again. And I'm like, you have a very, I didn't say, I thought you have a very uh, weird way of demonstrating <laughs> that you're like, so I think sometimes uh, teachers, they think they like the tough love thing, which is good, but you have to balance too. And, and I think it's important to empower the student and to, and to show a way because just telling a student, you're not good. What does that leave the student with? You have to show, okay, you're, now you're not good at this. I'm going to give you this. And if you practice every day, you're going to get there. And then when the student actually gets there, to acknowledge that because, and to empower the student to, so they keep growing, you know? So the, the, I think there's that aspect uh, too. Mm. You know? Hey, Cheryl, what, what's on your mind this whole time? I can see your mind working over there. <laughs> I want to kick it over to you. I should have taken some notes. There were so many just oh my God. really, really great things. I, I thinking about what you were talking about with Benny Green and then um, how that inspired you to practice because that, I always think that's sort of the, um, you know, I don't know, people say I play fast or something. So they come and they want to learn how to play fast. I, I don't think that I do and I can, but I, I know that. I practice really slow almost all day. Like when I show them on the metronome where I work most of the time. And so when they hear Benny say that, and you say that, and, and I've heard this from many, many people, <clears throat> you know, with, about people that I know that, that are virtuosos of this thing of slowing it down. And, and I feel about that is, you know, when we're practicing, we're training and programming a, our central nervous system. Yeah. really profoundly and 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 also i think this thing about the ear is it's not a tangible thing you know like we could go you know any student could go home on a break and and their parents would go what did you learn at berkeley and they, they I, oh i learned how to play a melodic minor scale let me show it to you but if yeah. they went home and their parents said what did you learn at berkeley say so i can hear a melodic minor scale <laughs> It'd be like, uh, okay, and and that's what you're doing, like, but but that's actually yeah. the deeper thing to be doing in many ways, right? Yeah. I think um, sometimes that process, that invisible thing, can be 
difficult to inspire a student to get that or you know and i and what you're saying too about this whole sort of all that glitters isn't gold like wow i could play all this stuff but there's no connection to well the ear and then the heart right yeah. or says, i have great ears but really all when if you played something chromatic they'll be like whoa i don't, yeah. I don't know if that so and i think there's that thing too of what you listen to in speed if you all, all you listen to is pentatonic type things pop melodies then you can hear that but if someone were to play bar talk you know they'd be like oh man oh my you know Absolutely. what is that because yeah. it's it's just not familiar so it's sort of that i guess i'm there's so many things there but whatever you want to talk about in there about um getting to know the unfamiliar from your ear um and also this thing of inspiring someone is really showing them that actually to go to go fast you know you you have to work slowly or you know because of that i guess the last thing i say about it, i think about when i was a student i realized that i could only play what i hear and so i wanted to do all kinds of things so i i made it a priority to do ear training every day and it was frustrating right as you know mm -hmm, yeah. sometimes you, you could go in three or four days in a row and you feel like nothing and then yeah. the other day you're like oh nailing everything and kind it's of not going, linear yeah it goes like that and then i remember distinctly being in star market and the music or whatever it was was playing and i was transcribing it and it felt right. like a quantum moment yes. like i burst through and i was like wait and then it modulated there and then it went to that chord and then but it was that thing like the, having that faith to, in the process yeah and then that's the thing with these invisible things with your ear so anyway you can choose any of that there's a lot of stuff because you yeah. you gave me a lot of thoughts and, and there's the 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 thing with the simplicity i i remember i was watching uh, like a video a instructional video of the great mike moreno it, i'm a huge fan of his playing and um uh, and he said the first thing he does when a, a student comes to study with him, he said, okay, I wanted to play rhythm changes in B flat, and I wanted to play only half notes, and I, I need to know that I need to hear the harmony immediately. It has to be no questions about that. And they all fail. You know, you think, how much more simple can it be? You're only going to play two notes per bar, but they don't hear the harmony. They don't know. They don't hear the voice leading the guide tones. So of course, they're playing all these notes. They're playing uh, B flat uh, um, pentatonic, major pentatonic, or minor pentatonic, G minor pentatonic, and you're not really outlining the harmony. You know. So uh, I think that to me, that was like, oh, that's like a really, really revealing thing. You see sometimes people that can execute really fast, but you're like, eh, you're not really playing the, the harmony, right? It's, it doesn't sound bad because it kind of fits the general thing, but, but, you know, it's not really, really there. But to develop that discipline and say, okay, I have to go back and I have to start practicing just guide tones over tunes, you know? How many people have that that uh, uh, discipline, you know? Yeah. Jilson, what drew you to teach ear training? Like, what was it about this subject as a player that really made you want to focus on it? So I started my professional life in Brazil and uh, Brazil, the scene is very, the music scene is very different now. You know, uh, I think the whole world is kind of becoming homogenous because, you know, people like you're watching Instagram and getting the same thing all over. But back then uh, there was very, how can I, there was not a lot of importance given if you could read or improvise on the music scene, like uh, if you're playing like nightclubs and stuff. The thing is, could you hear and could you 
back singers uh, playing the transpose, like for if you're in a rhythm section, that kind of stuff. So, and I, I didn't have good ears at all. So uh, there are people like some of the older players that are playing like brutal on stage, like really like humiliating me on stage, which now I know I would sue them, I would, you know, but back then that, that was the norm, you know, you got humiliated and uh, it, either you may you make you quit or it makes you stronger. That was the mentality, whatever, you know, whatever people think about that, if it's good or bad, but that that's how it was. So I started to be obsessed about this. I have to get better, you know, I have to. So I started working on that, um, transcribing, trying to learn as much as possible by ear, learning, sort of making a pack of not learning music from the sheet music. Even if that meant that maybe some chords I couldn't hear and it was wrong and it take me, took me forever to learn, you know. So then when I came to Berkeley, I came later, I was 26, I was older than the average Berkeley student. And I had already been a professional for like five years. So uh, I knew my priorities, no one needed to tell me, because I already had experience in the what I needed to be successful professionally. So uh, I just immersed myself in your training. And because I didn't have a lot of for formal um, education as a musician in Brazil, I said, I want to start, even though it was very easy, I said, I want to start a year training one, because that's my chance to get some formal education, which I didn't know at the time, but ended up being very helpful to me. Because uh, when I taught and then being a chair, I have an intimate knowledge of the curriculum, you know, from inside out. So I took all levels. And then there's one particular teacher, Scott McCormick, who uh, it was the biggest inspiration for me, you know. Uh, he was just like unbelievable as a teacher. The the way he made the subject fun and and I was so immersed into that. Um, and at the same time, I was studying with Charlie Banacos that is very famous around Boston. And he had this very particular ear training method that, uh, that I found very, very helpful for me, you know. So that started my interest in the in the area. And I in around I graduated in in 90, 96. I should have graduated in 94, but I extended a little bit. And then uh, in around 98, 99, I started working uh, for the voice department as an accompanist. And around 2000, where the new buildings that they're building at uh, on Boylston, there's to be a parking lot. And I remember I was going to the parking lot and one of my professors that I had year training for, which that we really had a great relationship, Roberta Radley, you know, because she saw I was super serious in class. And I, for my final transcription, I transcribed McCoy Tyner's solo on Inception. It's like seven pages and I, I could play it really well. Uh, you know, and, and, and we struck like a, a good relationship outside of class. She saw that I was serious. So she, from time to time when I would see her, it's like, Hey, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. So on that day, I'm, I'm going to my car and I see Roberta coming and she's like, Hey, how are you? I said, hey, I'm here working as an accompanist for the voice department. It's like, wow, why don't you, don't you want to teach here? And I said, yeah, I, I'd love to, but I, I heard that you, you have to somehow know the chair, so you, uh, away. So I, well, she said, well, you know me, and I'm the assistant chair of the year training department. She said, I can't promise you anything, but why don't you come by, drop your resume and stuff, and if there's an opening. And exactly to the day, a year later, she called me, said, we, we uh, have a, 
an opening and we're interviewing people. So I interviewed and like was one of the finalists and then ended up getting the job, you know. I think that's a huge lesson to everyone who's a student. You have to do well in all your classes. I mean, not like you have to get the best grade. That doesn't matter. You have to work really hard and you have to be on time and be present. And even if something's hard for you and you feel like you're not getting it, the fact that you are there working makes a huge impression that lasts many years. And you never know, right? Yeah. You never know. You never know. Well, it's like I told you, my year training teacher, my sophomore year was um, Dr. Usula, Kari Usula, and he was the dean here. Yeah. I didn't know where he had ended up 15 years later, but yeah. um, his son had been my first student, and we connected on Facebook. And then, mm. so that's why he knew where I was on Facebook. And then when he saw my name, come through he he called me in traffic he was like he wrote me on facebook like hey can i call you and he called me and then and he said yeah you know i remember you in your training and i remember what you were like as a student and like it really was the first time someone had said this really matters in your life and it See, obviously yeah. mattered in your life too you know yeah, you and never you never know you're like oh yeah i'm gonna wait until i'm a professional to act professionally yeah you never will and it, yeah. that topic was so hard for me, as I as I said openly, I openly say how hard it was. But it, he saw me work hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, so we're we, all humans, you know, right? Yeah. Right. We remember things, you know, and, and uh, you make a mental note. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Anthony Bourdain, you know, mm -hmm. the famous uh, chef. I And he has a thing he, he wrote. He said, when you work as, in the... Uh, as a chef, you in the kitchen world said uh, it's a meritocracy. So you learn one thing really fast. There are two types of people in the world. One is the, is the people that say they're going to do something and they do. And then there's everybody else. You know, and I, I'm a firm believer of that. Wow. Um, Cheryl, I know you want to say something, so I'm going to throw it to you and then to Ben. No, I mean, I think everything is so spot on. There's just so much um, that you're sharing with us. But it, actually, I would like to know what Ben is thinking about, because I know Ben <coughs> told me, told us that he would, struggled with ear training and then he made it his challenge. Right. Tell us about that. Yeah, because uh, well, another thing, too, I was kind of thinking about um, that I can relate to because I started Berkeley. I was a little bit older than most students as well because when I first graduated high school, I, I studied at Musicians Institute Hollywood for a little while first before I decided to to you know come back home to to Boston and go to Berkeley. So at that point, I already had you know some experience you know not only in like an academic setting, but it was, it was it was it's I guess coming into to Berkeley or coming and in, going to any college academic situation and realizing, you know, you might not know what you want, but, um, you know, it, it's, you're, you're there to learn and you're there. It's not like high school where you have to be there. You know, it, it's uh, kind of like what, what Kim said too. Your teachers are there to help you and you have to be able to, to, to put the work in. But, um, yeah, for me, I, uh, I never really learned how to read music very well you know growing up um because i mean my, my high school didn't have any music courses or anything like that so by the time i got to berkeley um i was really intimidated by it and uh you know my, my ear training class my first semester i'd never heard of solfege before like that was brand new to me i'm already really intimidated by um you know not being a very strong reader and kind of like what, what kim said too it was kind of this feeling of like am i going to be exposed because <laughs> you know i i can't i, I don't feel confident in this um, and then conducting while doing it too, it was, it was like the com combination of those three was like, forget it. And that, my first semester, I, I almost withdrew from the college completely. I almost, <laughs> you know, like this, this, this isn't for me. Um, I, I remember I withdrew from my ear training class uh, because wow. at that point I, I was just, I, got, I had gotten to my, my own head so much. So I'm like, I'm just going to fail this. I talked to the teacher about it because I was going to the teacher's office hours every week. And um, I didn't do very well in the midterm. I said, I really want to withdraw. Uh, but I told him, I said, 
I'm doing this because I don't want to fail. I said, is there any way I can still come to the class if I withdraw? And he said, absolutely. He said, you'll come and you know, he said, be auditing the class. So I, even though I withdrew, I still showed up to class every week, um, still you know, did the homework, even though it wasn't for a grade. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got put in the, uh, I don't know if, if Berkeley might still offer this, but I got put in the second semester success program, which I guess is anyone that um, withdraws or fails, you know, core music class your first semester, mm -hmm. gets put in that second semester. So from there, I, I, I felt pretty defeated in my second semester. I'm like, you know, I'm not going to let this kind of get the best of me. And I, I really buckled down and, and tried to, it came to the point where I was like, all right, it's like, I shouldn't feel intimidated because I'm not confident in this. Like it should just be, you know, if I have to work three times as hard as the person sitting next to me to get the same grade, like, then so be it. Like, yeah, I'm just gonna have to work harder. And, um, you know, then by the time I finished all my core music classes, I actually got hired to be a student core music tutor because I, I was able to kind of get my, my chops up. And then, um, you know, it, it, was, it was, that was kind of like the, I think everyone kind of has like the Berkeley moment at some point as a student here. And, and for like that kind of time in between my first and second semester, that's kind of where, where I had that moment where it's like, all right, this is either I'm going to do this or kind of like what you said. It's like, I, I, I'm either going to say I'm going to do this and do it or I'm going to be a well, it's, <laughs> it's It's curious that you said because I, I can't tell you how many experience I had that with a student um, that usually happens after midterm, right? If you fail, then it's like, okay, what am I going to do? So they come to my office. They would come to my office hour for the first time. So I was like, okay, sit down and show me how you practice. So they would demonstrate to me exactly the opposite of everything that I was teaching in classic, how in classic classes, how to go about it. Because I was very methodic, do this, then do that, and they go to my and do the opposite. So I'm like, okay, get a piece of paper. I'm going to tell you each step and we're going to practice together two bars and because I wanted them to experience what it is to perform at a, a really high level because once you, it's almost catching a, a, a bug right once you experience that you crave that but you have to first because it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy you believe that you can't do it that you don't have talent and it's not is a question of it's it's a it's a technical process it's not a mystery it's just follow these steps be methodic about it put it together step by step isolating each thing so you isolate the rhythm with conducting fix the problems there don't when you can't read the rhythm don't go on stop let figure out how to read that Okay, you figure out the rhythm, you can do it conducting at a fast tempo, great, put that aside. Let's go over the pitch, just without rhythm, without anything, just sing the solfege and the pitch for each note. Don't BS, if you can't find a note, let's work on that. Why can't you hear that work? Once you solve that, you can do, then put it together and it stays together then you know then you increase the tempo slowly until you can do it then you learn two bars and if you learn two bars you're gonna learn eight 16 you know but it's just and again it goes back to the same thing human beings want shortcuts Ah, now he's telling me, but I'm going to go home and I'm just going to play on the piano and memorize that or I'm going to write down the solfege and cheat you know People want shortcuts, and then, unfortunately, there are no shortcuts in music or life, I think. Ben, I think that leads into the question that you uh, have taken on. Do you want to ask? Yes, I, I will ask Ian's question. <laughs> Check out Ian's. Uh, so I guess, really, I'm just, this is a great segue. With every, all the topics we've covered so far, like thinking back to when you were a student, and I know you even mentioned something earlier, um, you know, in, in this uh, episode about, oh, I, I wish that, you know, I knew this, you know, you know, back back then. What's what's the one question that you can think of 
that you think students should be asking that they might not think to ask, or maybe that you wouldn't have thought to ask when you were a student? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. I, you know, I, I'm afraid to say this because I'm so old compared to the students and I, I, I feel like I'm belong to a different universe. You know, my perspective when I was a Berkeley student, I wanted to play. I couldn't care about anything else, music, business. Well, social media didn't exist, but I'm sure I, would, I wouldn't care at all about that, uh, promoting myself. And I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm just saying that was all I wanted to do is practice and be the best possible player that I could be. That's all I care, you know, and, pre and play with other people, hopefully better than me, so I could learn. And, and that was that. But the, the world is different, you know, now. Like, I think I feel like students feel like that being able to play is just one part of the equation. Uh, being able to, I, I see students like they're, when you come to, when you talk about like harmony and ear training, they're like, oh man, this is so boring. But talking about contracts, they're like, oh, this is so exciting. I, it's hard for me to relate, you know, I, I try to be open minded, but I feel like it's like when I talk to my accountant, I like him a lot. But other than, uh, you know, I, I don't find what he does exciting for me, you know, so I don't have a lot to talk about that. So um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm running away to answer your questions, but I guess uh, for me still, like people, I, I always, I, people that don't want to learn what I call music, which is your training harmony. That's music, right? It's pitch, rhythm, harmony. What else there is in left in music? I don't know. But if, if you're a student at Berkeley and you don't have an interest on that, my, my first question is, why are you at a music school, you know? Why, why here? Because, uh, let's say, if you want to be a performer and, and you don't want to learn that, it's totally possible. There are a lot of phenomenal musicians that don't know how to read or don't know harmony, they, but they can play. So that's great. But if you come to a, a music school, I assume that is to learn that, right? Otherwise, maybe you could go to Harvard Business School and just focus on business, you know, or other places. So I just hope that there's still enough students that come to Berkeley that they want to be great musicians, you know. That's, and if, if that's your goal, then immerse yourself on that, you know. Take advantage of who are your heroes on on your instrument or music or and and what is the how did they get to be that you know uh, listen copy imitate dissect then create your own thing you know uh, I don't know I think that's Advice good from I, I mean, an old man <laughs> I like it I mean because I think all the majors, all the things that you could study at Berkeley, they're all avenues, you know, and, and in, in a lot of ways that mimics what the professional world is like. Like if, you know, I went to school for performance all the way through my doctorate and I've done so many different things in addition to performance. And I've been a writer, I've been an arranger, I've been a composer, I've been a teacher, I've been an administrator, I've, you know, started nonprofits of it. And like, and, you know, I mean, anybody will tell you that. But I think what I've learned as like a, you know, to say, listen to the old man, listen to the old ladies and the old woman in the group, um, is that working on yourself 
in the core musicianship, it gives you so much that you can apply to anything. Even yeah. if if you come here because you love music, but you know you want to be in music business, really developing yourself on your instrument and in in on your ear and in harmony, the way that you think about what brought you to music in the first place is a transferable skill yeah. when you're working with people in the music business. And I know it doesn't seem that way sometimes to people, but then later on, you know, I, I used to have teachers who now I appreciate even more when they'll say like, get, write me a letter in five years. And then I always would. And, and, and most of the time, you know, that moment would come like kind of the career version of the moment Ben talked about where you're like, Oh, that's why, you know? And so yeah, you have yeah. to take a little bit on faith, but if music brought you here, then you'll never lose time um, working on yourself as a musician. Those are all transferable skills to every possible related field and, and maybe some that don't even seem related. Well, that's what Ber I, I figured in my mind, my perception, that's what would be the Berkeley differential. Because if you want to be a, a sound engineer, right? And if you go to just a, to learn the technical aspects, it's one thing, but I always thought that the differential of Berkeley, you have a sound engineer that you can actually talk about music that understands the language and co can communicate with, with musicians. You know, when you talk to them, we are talking uh, about edits or something with the sound engineer say, oh, when we get to that section with the major seven, nine, that's when you should do that. And, and the person is like, oh yeah, I got you, you know? To me, well, that yeah. that would be that would be like the reason to come to Berkeley. Otherwise, just go to a place that doesn't offer music. Same thing for music business, you know. Sure. I mean, you know, I feel I have experienced that. I I worked in a studio, a really great studio, for three years as a producer, and was hired because of my ears. After all that ear training work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, because they could find other people to teach some of the tech stuff to, some of the setup stuff to, but they couldn't find enough people to come and really hear what was happening in the session. Well, that, that's why the, the, the performance world is, is great, because in, if you're going to perform, no one cares where you went to school or if you have a PhD or whatever. Mm -hmm. Can you play? You know, and and that's it. It's right there. So, in a way, the the and and the opportunities for performance are are so small nowadays. Is is different, but um, I think that's uh, that's something that I think is great about it's it's a real uh, meritocracy. You know? Yeah, and and I, like I just want to mention to your point about music business. If you have put yourself through this type of training and experience that we're talking about as you develop your musicianship, you're the best manager because you understand. That's exactly. who people want to work with. They want they they know you understand why it's not okay to take this flight versus the other one or why mm -hmm. you need so, you know, the hotel has to be near, you know, over here. Like you're not guessing, you yes. know, like, oh, this is going to make a lot more sense because this is what they're dealing with. And um, because you already know and you've been through it and and people are likely to trust you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, hey, Cheryl, what's on your mind as we're kind of wrapping up our coffee? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for being on our podcast. Um, thank I you. know people. I know and myself go back and listen to these over and over again because, for instance, our conversation here, we touched on so many deep things. I re thank you for sharing the process of practicing and that, um, you know, something that seems so abstract and invisible like hearing or developing your ear is very quantifiable and and something that you break down and and also hopefully people will not be afraid to be able to be vulnerable and say, hey, I, I can't do, show me how to do this. And I, and I also kind of do what Ben said, well, you know, who learns about ear training before you get to music school? I mean, it does happen, but that's more the, the rarity. And yeah. so, you know, everybody needs day one <laughs> yeah. to be a beginner, exactly. but also- Or day I, zero. 
I love that you shared that you feel like a beginner every day because I know that I do. And I think everybody here who has developed something has that every day you pick up your instrument and you're a beginner. So thanks for um, emphasizing thank that. You. And thank you for, for, for inviting me. I really appreciate it talking. Yeah, it's, it's great. How about you, Ben? Do you have a final thought? Uh, I think, you know, from doing all these coffee talks this semester, my first kind of season on this, the reoccurring theme that seems to be with every guest is really trust the process and, and trust, you know, your, your teachers, the experts and, and trust the work. And that's just a theme, a theme that, you know, seems to come up in every single one. So I think that's something that's really to be said about that. Justin, yeah. do you have a last thought? Uh... No, I, I mean, I, 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 I just hope, I mean, I, okay, I, I have a last thought. I, of all the, the, of all the great musicians that I had the, that I was blessed to, to play with, I would say they were completely different one from another, but there's only one thing that I can say for sure that all of them had in common. They all had great, unbelievable years, all of them, you know, mm. so that's, that's something great. for people to think about. Yeah, that is great. I think that's a, this is going to be really helpful as people are choosing their classes for next fall and getting ready for a fresh start. That's always the fall semester. Yeah. You can always um, just Take your summer and take out your your training exercises right along with everything else that you're working please, on. Please, please <laughs> don't forget about your training in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> your training in the summer. It yes. sounds like a good summer movie, yes. but you make it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to keep talking, um, but thank you, uh, Cheryl Bailey. Thank you, Jillson. And thank you, Ben. Um, and everyone out there will be with you on the next Coffee Talk. Thank you.